Hello and welcome back. Today we're looking at a gold farm. Uh, this gold farm is a, a modified version of a popular farm that was originally designed by uh, Nenbaum. This version comes equipped with a, a full on off switch and uh, some slightly different uh, storage options. Nenbaum's design can create enough gold to craft uh, 600 gold blocks per hour, whereas this design will uh, can get you up to uh, 562 uh, gold blocks per hour. Uh, one thing to note about this is uh, my design does include a simplified storage system um, which can't keep up uh, with the full drop rate when doing player kills um, but it can sustain on 9.3 gold blocks per minute for uh, several minutes before it starts to back up so we'll go through the storage options near the end this gold farm it needs to be built in another waste biome it's the biome that has uh, by far the most zombified piglin spawns um, and this farm can be built uh, above the nether, uh, above the nether roof, or uh, you can build a perimeter for it and eliminate all spawnable space within a 128 block radius. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, this design I used uh, 17 layers. I think the original Nembomb design had uh, 19. Um, but I think that that's a reasonable compromise because if you uh, watch the counter on the right, um, the number of zombified piglin in the world is pretty consistently uh, around so, uh, 60 or more. Next, we'll take a look at the spawn platforms. Uh, these platforms need to be built out of magma blocks uh, because zombified piglin are the only mobs that can spawn on these magma blocks. The shape of the platform is very close to the original Nimbob design. Uh, however, we did add some blocks um, around the outside here on these edges and that is because of how we're doing the on off mechanism uh, so as you might imagine we're going to be using uh, flowing lava in order to uh, cover spawnable space um, so all, each platform is going to have a dispenser with a lava bucket on it that will be triggered by an observer from below and that lava will uh, flow out and cover up the spawnable space uh, lava also emits a light uh, so there are a few blocks away from each lava that uh, will no longer be able to spawn as well, which means that your adjacent lava uh, doesn't actually need to touch. Um, so this pattern here uh, creates enough light that no zombified piglins will be able to spawn on the space between here. Uh, you'll notice that the lava over here flows out all the way down to our center drop chute, but over here it does not. Uh, the reason for that is because while the lava is out, um, originally the zombified piglins they will still be here so they need to be able to have space to uh, walk over and uh, fall down this drop chute. Um, I found that one space wasn't enough um, so these blocks had to be moved back enough to leave these two spaces here for the zombified piglin to pathfind and uh, fall down the drop chute. The platforms do require walls. Uh, the first level of the wall is obviously to keep your lava in uh, however, I found if you only had one level of wall surrounding these platforms, your uh, zombie pigs will actually try to jump on top of this. Uh, so you do need two levels um, all the way around, um, which effectively puts these, uh, completely encapsulates this with the above section. The drop chute in the center um, uses grindstones just like Nembomb's design, and the reason for that is to prevent uh, two zombie pigs from reaching this block at the exact same moment and they'll collide with each other and neither of them will be able to uh, jump down the drop chute. Um, so because these are just a little bit smaller than a full block it creates enough of uh, a difference that one pig will always be able to get ahead of the other um, and it creates a much more consistent environment for the zombie pigs to be able to properly fall down the drop chute. One difference that you'll notice is that in my design we have an additional uh, stone cutter right here. Um, the reason for this is actually striders. So when you have your lava dispensed, uh, striders will occasionally spawn on this lava. Um, so they're they're passive mobs, so they don't affect the mob cap, but they do exist in this space then once you turn the farm back on. Um, over time, the zombie piglins, they will uh, push the striders towards the center, and there was not enough space here for a strider to actually fall down. Um, so we needed to free up an additional pixel here um, in order for the striders to be able to fit through this space. And it just so happens that the stone cutter was, again, the perfect block to allow that to happen. So the other blocks surrounding the job shoot are glass. Um, and of course, the, the most important block that allows these farms to work is the turtle egg. Uh, so the turtle eggs are positioned every other platform 
and they are the egg is one block below the magma block platform. So they'll be like this um, in between every other platform. I'll pause above the platform here for a few seconds so you can copy this for your build. Back over here at the main farm, we'll take a look at how we stack platforms on top of each other and how the redstone dispenses the lava. Uh, so like a lot of my other farms, these are activated using a, a target block. Um, the target block is going to extend this piston, which is attached to the observing side of this observer, uh, which will uh, light up this redstone when it's fully extended. So the, uh, the redstone just goes around this farm and hits a uh, piston with a redstone block on it that will update these note blocks. Uh, these don't have to be note blocks, there's a few different ways to do it. I like the note blocks so that you can toggle these individually by punching them if you want to. So if we follow this around, um, it goes around this way to just hit that one side, but the other way it needs to hit this side. Uh, the signal needs to be re-strengthened right here with uh, a repeater and another observer just to get a proper pulse and then leading around the side here to the, uh, the the final redstone tower. One thing to note is that these redstone blocks they're being single ticked so each time they're pulsed um, they are pushed forward and although the piston retracts the redstone blocks are uh, left extended So once this note block is updated, it uh, hits an observer, which uh, activates the first dispenser and dispenses the lava. And then above the first dispenser, there are two more observers to carry the signal upward, uh, where it then hits the second dispenser. And of course, uh, the chain reaction goes all the way to the top of the tower, extending uh, all of the lava, dispensing all of the lava. And once all the lava is dispensed, uh, no more Sumpified Piglin will be able to spawn on these platforms. To sh show the switch in action, we will uh, track the lava. And we'll just turn the mob spawns back on. And within a few seconds here, you should start to see the Zombified Piglin spawn in. And by the, the counter on the right, you can see that we're already up over uh, 60 zombified piglins and they've started uh, falling down the chute so if we come in here and we hit that target block the lava will be dispensed and you'll see that uh, zombified piglin count uh, pretty quickly drop down to zero looks like this time we didn't make it quite to zero we have a few of um that are stuck like that. Um, after a minute or so, they will eventually uh, pathfind their way down to the drop chute. And there he goes. The original farm, this farm can be switched back and forth between uh, player kill mode and uh, drop kill mode. Uh, so right now you see those honey blocks are retracted, so the zombified piglin, they'll fall down onto these hoppers and they'll die. Um, so the first layer of the platform up there is 54, and with the honey blocks in place, the honey's at 30. So there's your 24 blocks. But with your honey in place, uh, honey reduces 80% uh, fall damage, I think, or something like that. So the piglins will take some damage, but they won't die and allow you to get in here and uh, kill them with your swords. So real quick, we'll take a look at the, uh, the mechanism that's over here that's doing the... Uh, the the honey extension so this is a double piston extender um, so when you hit this button there are two pistons here that are activated together uh, the first one is attached to this sticky piston the second one is attached to this observer so the idea is both of these will push out at the same time uh, the sticky piston and this observer um, the sticky piston is attached to all of this honey which will make all the honey move together uh, so once both all of those are extended by one block together, this observer will update and emit a pulse, and that pulse will hit this uh, sticky piston here, which will uh, push it an additional block out, so that results in all of this honey being extended by two blocks. 
So we'll hit this button. And hopefully you can see that on the side. Let's try this. And you see in my design, it also brought along some uh, nether brick fence, which uh, which is fine. I think the original design in some of the popular tutorials, um, I think they use like terracotta or um, melons to uh, prevent honey from sticking to things. Um, I like using just furnaces. Um, any immovable block uh, will work just fine. Also across the back, you notice I added a few extra grindstones here. So these three grindstones create a little bit more space. Um, in here so that you have a few more drops are able to land on that back set of honey and that is just to help distribute the drops a little bit better so you get a few more landing on the back uh, which takes a little bit of the pressure off of these uh, front three hoppers also you notice there's an end rod in here and an end rod is also to keep your zombified piglin from grouping up in the center which they'll tend to do so instead you kind of have a big group on the left and a big group on the right and that's also an effective means of distributing the drops uh, a bit more evenly across the, all of the, the kill area in here. And the reason for a lot of those changes is because I came up with uh, my own storage system, which is not as fast, but I think it's a little easier to build. It uses uh, some more hoppers up on top, but it uses the standard uh, item filters here um, in a, a configuration that's more familiar to most people. Um, as opposed to what was in the original design, which uh, uses a lot of uh, hopper minecart tricks um, for spreading the items out. So uh, we'll go through both of these in detail, and you can pick which one you want to use. So I've uh, broken out some blocks here, and you can see we have uh, five hoppers going across, um, and they actually feed backwards into five more hoppers. So those are your ten main pickup hoppers. Um, and below them are... Uh, more hoppers that are feeding out to the side. So you see your uh, your midpoint is roughly right here and uh, you'll see that those feed that way and these feed that way. And uh, these rows on the back, they, uh, they're doing the same thing. Though I think this one's actually feeding the opposite way, like that. And that is just to uh, help distribute the drops uh, as evenly as possible. So as these 10 uh, top hoppers feed down uh, we want them to be able to drop down into a corresponding filter as fast as possible. Uh, so the way we go about doing that is we have a whole bunch of uh, these filters set for gold nuggets and rotten flesh. And we have them set up in kind of a, an alternating fashion. So, um, nugget, flesh, nugget, flesh, nugget going across. Um, and then the outside most filters are where your gold ingots will be picked up. Um, of course, you only get gold ingots in the uh, player kill mode. And then on the outside, we have uh, an unfiltered setup, and this is where any gold swords will go um, until until those uh, chests fill up, in which case they'll just continue over top, and they'll go into a, uh, a lava burn mechanism. So in around the back, um, there is a duplicate filter setup. Uh, we're using a pretty standard mechanism for getting rid of the gold swords. Um, when they make it to the end of the filter train, they're dropped into these droppers here. And when enough items end up in these droppers, uh, it activates this comparator, which comes around. Um, it hits a repeater, which will extend this piston. The piston puts an observer in front of this other observer, which creates an observer clock, which will uh, trigger that dropper. And the dropper will just continue to drop items until it's below the limit for the comparator. Uh, so for single items, uh, sometimes if, if single items make it in here, there might be some left, but uh, swords, they count for I think 12 or 15 or something, so you only need uh, two or three of them in there before the dropper um, activates. And uh, that same circuit is copied uh, two times on each side. So two times over here, and another two times over here. The system comes with uh, two additional features. Uh, the first one is uh, overflow protection for the rotten flesh. Um, so over here you'll see we have uh, two more of those drop mechanisms and they are tied into the filters for the rotten flesh. Um, so it's uh, right here, this would be rotten flesh, and this one over here, with the one in the middle of course being cold nuggets. Um, you see if I break this out, this one is actually pointing out instead of down 
Um, so what that'll do is that diverts about half of the rotten flesh into this dropper, where the other half will still continue down. However, once this uh, item silo fills up and it reaches this point, all of them will be diverted out here into these hoppers. Um, so there are, I guess, eight different rotten flesh uh, filters. Um, and all of them, when they're filled up, they'll be diverted out into these uh, droppers and uh, it'll burn up any additional rotten flesh. So I double checked and there are four zombie flesh filters on each side and five golden nugget filters on each side. So, and uh, because each of the filters is common in this chest right here, you only need this uh, zombie flesh uh, overflow protection on the back because they are the back and the front hoppers. They're effectively joined together once they reach this first uh, this first double chest. And of course, this overflow protection is op optional, so you don't have to build it if you don't want. The other additional feature that this has is overflow protection on um, all of the other items. So I currently have this set up to um, alert for any item that's about to overflow, um, but it's really not necessarily with the zombie flesh. Uh, so the idea here is we have uh, some hopper diverters coming off of the front this side in a, a similar way, except this time it's coming out of the first double chest. It's diverted over, down, and back in. So under normal conditions, uh, when this hopper pulls out of the first double chest, it will uh, immediately be pulled out by this hopper and work its way down. Um, but once the items back up to the point where these hoppers start to fill up, then the items will go from this hopper and around this way. Um, so once you start getting items into these hoppers on the side here, uh, this comparator will eventually go off. Uh, when, when that does, it uh, powers this block, which turns off that torch, which turns on that torch. Um, and we'll ultimately light this light and uh, power this uh, these note blocks here. So I picked a, a gold block just because it makes a, a nicer sound. Uh, so this this lever here will uh, simulate what that'll be like. So you get a, a tone and a light will turn on telling you that that filter is uh, pretty close to being full. Um, so it's a, a double chest plus a little bit more away from from being uh, full up and overflowing. Um, and of course, when you're using item filters like this, overflow can be a big problem uh, because when these overflow, uh, that will cause all of your filter item uh, setup to get uh, washed away and ruined. So the, the changes to implement this, uh, it was pretty simple. So you, you have just your, your standard item filter here, uh, three blocks across the top, this block, this block, and these glass blocks are part of your normal item filter. However, here they're glass, where um, in most designs you just see them being uh, just, you know, a normal solid block. Um, they need to be glass in this case because they can't conduct power or else you'll uh, you'll short out your item, your item filters. So as you're standing on the player platform up here, whether you're uh, AFK using drop, using uh, the drop mode or you're um, actively killing the zombified piglin, uh, you should be able to hear the tone pick up. Um, these buttons, they're just here for spawn proofing. Next we'll take a look at the item sorting that was part of the original design. So it uses um, hopper mine carts to distribute the items out over a wider array of uh, hoppers. Um, so on the top here, you start off with uh, the 10 hoppers um, in the same configuration as we saw before, um, except now below them we have three hoppers, uh, hopper minecarts here, and they are arranged such that each one is able to pull out of four hoppers um, above it. And then the next step after that is to expand it out even more, where the layer below it has uh, four hoppers, um, and the four hoppers are able to reach um, out of uh, one or two of the hoppers above. Um, and underneath that we have, uh, what is this, 14? 14 hoppers that are pulling out of those uh, hopper minecarts. Um, so effectively you're going, you, these two levels of hopper minecarts are to go from a uh, 10 hopper item limit down to a uh, 14 uh, hopper item limit. Um, so these hoppers are then fed into droppers and the droppers has some uh, redstone that uh, drops the items into these cobwebs. So first we'll take a look at the redstone for these uh, droppers. 
um, you can actually place a, a block next to the droppers and put a comparator on that block and that will able, be able to read the fill value of that dropper through this block. Uh, so that's what this is doing. Um, so if there's enough uh, items in that dropper to uh, output this uh, comparator, um, we're just repeating that signal into this block, which will uh, extend this piston above it. And that piston pushes forward an observer, uh, creating an observer clock, um, which although it's pulsing into uh, this hopper, it's also triggering uh, this dropper to drop whatever items are in it. Um, so it's, it's dropping uh, the items into cobwebs, and the purpose of that is because cobwebs uh, slow down items so much, it allows the items to uh, group up into bunches instead of being individual items. So uh, it's, a, it's a little friendlier on the, the server as far as uh, entity calculations go. Uh, so the next step after that, um, see I actually have this part of the circuit turned off. Um, so in, in mine I put a, a lever up here instead of having the automated method that they used. So those items those fall down and they go down this uh, set of steps here. And when they reach the bottom of the steps they fall in front of this honey block and that honey block um, which is slightly smaller than one block. Um, it pushes the items that are on top of an ender chest, which is also slightly smaller than one block, um, which lines it up perfectly to be hit by uh, this slime block um, to slide it across this ice um, perfectly on top of, of uh, both of these blocks so they will be picked up by the hoppers but still get the slide speed of the ice. So in this case, um, you saw I picked up the glowstone here because obviously none of these filters are set up for our glowstone. So the, the roadstone for this isn't isn't as bad as it seems. Um, so this is actually using a uh, comparator clock uh, where you have two comparators facing opposite directions like this with uh, you have one feeding into a block and then this block has a redstone uh, porch on the other side. Uh, so it has redstone feeding back into the other one. So what that does is it, uh, it causes this signal to dissipate over time. So over on the right hand side of, uh, of the screen you see the power, it uh, spikes up to uh, 13 and then slowly dissipates down to zero, at which point the redstone torch turns back on and uh, starts it again. So uh, this clock design is different from the, the original, um, but I, I thought this was a little bit simpler. So uh, when this redstone torch turns on just for a short amount of time, uh, we're extending this sticky piston with the redstone block on it. Uh, the redstone block, when it extends down, um, the signal is kind of going three directions. Uh, so first it's uh, hitting this repeater here, which goes up the step and it's firing uh, this piston. Um, all these repeaters are on a maximum delay. Um, it's also heading across this way where it splits off and uh, these two repeaters are where it hits the piston that's attached to the honey block. Um, and the signal goes across over to here to, to this uh, piston that activates that side of the step. Um, so you see the, the number of repeaters that we're using is what's affecting the, the sequencing. Um, so there's three things that happen. Uh, first you have the steps that go in and retract. So that's uh, one repeater here on full delay, and the other side of the steps are uh, this repeater right here. Uh, the next thing that happens is the block with the honey on it right here has to extend. Uh, so that's right here, two repeaters. And the final step is that this piston down here with the slime block pushes the items across the, across the ice. So that's these three repeaters right here. And once the items are sliding across the ice, um, they get picked up by standard item filters. So the recommendation is that you have uh, two of them set for gold ingots if you're doing player kills. And then I think it has uh, seven that are set up for uh, gold nuggets. And in this case, all of the zombie flesh and swords uh, just slide along into the lava. and. Uh, it is worth noting that there's a ton of spawnable space on uh, this over here, so you do need a whole bunch of light to make sure that nothing spawns. 
So the, the original design, you just used some additional redstone coming off the back of this that actually led down and uh, stopped the clock. Um, but that actually didn't allow all the items to be picked up. You would end up with any items that were still going through the system when the droppers were emptied uh, would eventually just be lost and despawned. Um, so that's why in, in mine I uh, wired up this uh, this lever up here, uh, which just comes across, hits a piston with some uh, slime box, and it extends a redstone block down into a block which powers this piston. Um, and that's the, the piston that has the redstone block that we were looking at before that uh, sets up all the timing. So everything is just extended all the time uh, while this lever is turned on. So next we'll take a look at how to set up all your hopper minecarts. Um, so like we talked about before, you have your uh, 10 normal collection hoppers. Uh, you have your uh, top level of your hopper minecarts. Uh, your bottom level of your hopper minecarts will go here. And then it's extending down into your, uh, your uh, 14 hoppers that are leading into your droppers. So I found the easiest way is to start with a setup that looks like this. Um, so you have... Uh, some glass panes uh, set up in a pattern that looks like this with some blocks on these three uh, hoppers below and that's where your three hoppers that are on the top level those three are originally set up so we'll show how that works set the set one up here drop it down onto the block and then we need to get rid of this block and replace it with a pane. And the easiest way to do that is to push it over with a piston and you can get rid of this block. We'll do the same here. And once those three hopper minecarts is, are in place, you kind of want to nudge them back into the corner a little bit. Um, that's what these glass panes are for. Uh, I think you can also use end rods for those if you want to. And just like that. So the bottom ones, uh, we don't need those anymore. Um, we'll do the center spot first here. You need to set a rail up the, that direction and you want to place two hopper mine carts on here. So just click one, click two, and then if you just walk into these they should split off in separate directions. There you go. And then you can break out that that rail. And those are set. And the uh, the last two, um, we need to use the stone cutter again to set the placement up for these. So like that, and like this. And then you just want to kind of nudge it back into the corner of the two stone cutters. And then we'll do the same thing over here on the other side. And like before, just nudge it back into that corner. And the reason it needs to be all the way back in the corner is because you do need the uh, hopper minecart to be a few pixels over top of this hopper. Um, that's why these stone cutters are needed, otherwise uh, it won't be able to be over top of this hopper. So next we'll just we'll take a look at this, uh, this system in action. So I have a setup over here where these are full. I'm just copying them over uh, so it fills all these droppers up with items. Uh, so you can see when they're all dispensing, all of these pistons are extended, and they're all dropping down into the cobwebs, allowing the items to bunch up. And eventually we'll start seeing these items drop down onto these stairs. And every time the stairs push in, it pushes, it pushes them closer to the center, and they're shot across the ice. Um, where the gold is uh, picked up in its appropriate filter. Also, one uh, trick I learned is uh, if you hold control and 
middle mouse click, you can actually copy items with their uh, contents in when in creative mode. Back over here at the farm, we'll just show this in action one more time. Um, so as you're killing these zombie piglin uh, with the, the limited uh, item storage system, uh, it's best if you can go uh, left to right when you're killing like this. And if you notice that uh, you're starting to have items uh, build up on the ground, you can uh, stop for a few seconds and uh, look through some of these hoppers and uh, pull out any cold swords that you see. That is all that I have for you today. Uh, be sure to check out uh, Nembom's uh, version of this farm. Um, he goes into uh, much further detail about uh, spawn mechanics and uh, other gold farm options uh, that I didn't talk about here today. Um, and also, uh, another Minecraft creator, uh, Shulkercraft, has a block-by-block -block tutorial on uh, how to build Nimbob's version of this farm. Um, if you like my version, uh, please consider uh, leaving a like and subscribing. Uh, thank you, and goodbye.